This is lecture number two on the age of imperialism, and today we're going to be focusing on Africa. And so this time period in Africa with the in relation to the Europeans is called referred to as the scramble for Africa. And what we see here from the time period about 1880 until 1890, a rapid increase and competition begins to heat up for uh, the Europeans in order to be able to grab places and parts of Africa. For not only, as we talked about in the previous uh, lecture, raw materials, but markets, and then also strategic locations. What the main thing that begins this is what's called the Berlin Conference. And this takes place in 1885. Berlin Conference is headed by Otto von Bismarck, who you remember is the new leader of the newly unified Germany, and by the Prime Minister of France, a guy by the name of Ferry. By 1885, Germany, unifying in 1871, has been a country for only 14 years. And when they finally become a country, they begin to look around and say, well, we want to be just like France. We want to be just like Great Britain. And so, like those other countries, Germany wants to go and create a worldwide empire. But when they begin to look around in 1871, they begin to realize well, there's not a lot of places left up for them to grab. It's all been already claimed by these other European countries and also by this point starting to be nibbled away by the United States. The Berlin Conference is created by Bismarck mostly in order to be able to give Germany a seat at the table and be able to go and look at one of the few untamed continents or unclaimed continents left in the world. Africa be able to carve it up amongst the Europeans for themselves. The Berlin Conference is going to state what the ground rules for the occupation of Africa is going to be or what the rules are going to be in order to be able to uh, carve up Africa amongst the Europeans. And what they say is that you have to effectively occupy the area in order to be able to claim it on a map. It's not that you can just be Queen Victoria and London and circle this part of Africa and say, it's ours. You need to have boots on the ground. You need to have actual soldiers or people from your country in those parts of Africa in order to be able to claim it for yourself. And that's discussed and ratified at the Berlin Conference. What this is going to do is divide Africa up amongst the Europeans. And this is going to lead pretty much to what we can refer to as the most harmful legacy of Africa, which is going to be its division. And what it's going to do is it's going to unite enemies that have been uh, against each other for a very long time, and it's going to divide kinship groups who are used to being there. The Europeans do not regard what the Africans have already created for themselves in any way, shape, or form. And so a lot of the divisions are just going to be, to the Africans, lines on a map that mean nothing to them. But to the Europeans, mean a whole lot. And when they try to impose those lines on a map, those lines on the ground, that's going to cause all sorts of different problems and really cause a lot of issues for Africa up into the present day. The other thing that emerges is out of the Berlin Conference is that Germany now steps up to the stage of trying to become an imperialist nation. The key takeaway is that because Germany starts so late in their quest for other imperial uh other places around the world they don't get any this is going to lead to a little bit of resentment and anger and trying to build up to take more stuff and again this is a, a way you can argue for world war one uh beginning france at the berlin conference is going to focus on you want to think of centrally north uh western part of um africa which is lake chad and they're going to try to be moving east and west britain is going to be moving north from its land holdings in South Africa and south from when it goes and takes over Egypt. So France is trying to move east and west. Britain is trying to move north and south. So again, if this slide is Africa, right? Uh, France is trying to move in over here and they're trying to conquer Africa east and west across the continent. Britain is going south from Egypt, north from South Africa. So they're going north and south and if you fold your hands right trace across the screen you'll see that well eventually they're going to meet and that's going to cause issues by 1900 with the berlin conference and the african territories that they gobble up britain is going to control one-fifth of the world's territory that's 20 percent of the world empire of, of its empires covering the world which is a lot and dealing back with the quote we talked about in the last lecture of the idea of the sun never setting on the british empire by the end of this scramble for Africa, 
1914 is kind of historically when this is, is closed. Europe is going to control all of the African continent, even places that are just piles of sand in the Sahara Desert, except for two places in Africa. One is the country of Liberia. Now, you should be able to see that it's very similar to the word liberty, and that should give you a clue on why it's the case, because Liberia is the backing of the United States. Liberia was set up as a country for African slaves living in America, who the Americans didn't want to have there, and let them go back to Africa, form their own country. And so Liberia is kind of be set up as a place for former African slaves in order to be able to live there. The United States kind of had a little bit of their backing, so they said to the Europeans, hands off. And then also Ethiopia. And those two countries are going to be there, and we'll see how Ethiopian independence in Africa is going to cause further problems in world history in the next couple of chapters. So it's important to remember that Africa is, one, a very diverse place. What you're looking up, what you're looking at is a map of all the different ethics slash linguistic groups of Africa. And you can see in the spot where the Sahara Desert is, there's bigger spots. But as you can see where there's more rivers or other places, there's a lot of people that have for generations, hundreds, thousands of years been living right on top of each other. People that have gotten along with other people, people who have historically been enemies. And what the Europeans are going to do is they're going to go in here and just start carving up blocks for what they think is nice for them, but are not going to regard any of this political, linguistic, social, or cultural uh, stuff that the Africans have already had for thousands of years. And that's going to cause all sorts of problems. Another thing to remember is that Africa is a big, giant place. Those are two United States the north and the south from there. And again, you could probably, if you fit it in there on the edges, on the stuff that's left over, another United States as well. This is a big, huge, giant continent that uh, on some map projections doesn't really show just how giant and big and enormous the continent is. And again, that's also going to play into a lot of the problems that the Europeans are going to run into, that the Africans are going to run into uh, again in this place. So this is the Berlin Conference. Again, you can see Bismarck and all these are the leaders of Europe who are sitting down and trying to go and carve all it up. You can see the big, huge, giant map of Africa in the back, again, led by the central figure in the center of the picture of Bismarck. And again, it should make sense that Germany and Bismarck are going to be leading a conference held in the capital city of Germany, Berlin. So what we see here is Africa before the scramble in 1876, and you can see how the Europeans have kind of just scrapped uh, spots either along the Nile River or along the coastline and not really penetrated too far in. Then we have the Berlin Conference, and the scramble begins. In 1914, this is how the map of Africa has changed, where you can very see you can see that there's very little spots in Africa that are not claimed, that are in, claimed by indigenous people. And again, the only independent states are the states of Liberia here on the western coast, coast and the state of Ethiopia here. Every place else is going to be claimed by Europeans. And this, again, the European colonialization is going to lead to lots of different problems uh, and other not only racial, but social and cultural issues that Africa is still dealing with. Uh, a lot today and through the 20th century is again these Europeans are showing up and doing issues of paternalism and colonialism and all stuff that doesn't really help a lot too much. And so you can see that this becomes a major problem for the people of Africa themselves as the cartoons kind of showing is that they're asleep while Africa begins to carve it off. And we do see lots of uh, places of African resistance. But the Africans are unable to fight off the uh, high, more highly industrialized, uh, m bigger, better military technology that the Western Europeans bring in to subjugate them in the continent themselves there. So throughout Africa, we see a lot of different uh, crises and other stuff as they begin to try to manage all the different things they have. The Fakoda crisis is the first major problem that the Europeans run into in terms of what happens when two colonial interests from Western Europe run into problems or literally run into each other in Africa. As we said, Great Britain's trying to go north and south, whereas France are trying to go east and west. And where do they go and meet? In Fashoda. And what this is, is you have 
uh, a British expedition marching from the Nile River south, right, to farther in the interior Africa, and from Lake Chad, the French are sending an ex army expedition east through there. And what happens? Well, they meet in Fashoda, and both guys peek out who they are. They lo they raise their guns and they say, "Oh, hey, it's another white person, right? Uh, the first group of Europeans from there." So there's not really a whole lot that happens in the actual meeting of the two armies. What it becomes a major event is back in Europe when the two governments in London and in Paris are looking at the maps and seeing that these two columns are marching right at to each other. And again, for national pride and issues of nationalism and other stuff, well, then they have to go and fight, and this becomes a big deal. And there's almost a major war that starts back in London, Paris, rather than, again, what's actually the situation on the ground between these two small forces in the midst of the uh, African interior. What ends up happening is the French look at this, say they don't want to, this, this is not a reason to get into a major conflict over, and they back down and they move away from that. Italy tries to work in from Italian Somaliland right, into Ethiopia. The Ethiopians are able to fight them off, and this is going to be a major uh, kind of thorn in the side of the Europeans, right, a major kind of rock in their shoe that's really going to irritate them for a long time. And it's not until the 1930s when Mussolini shows up with tanks poison gas, machine guns, airplanes, that the Ethiopians are friendly defeated by the highly mechanized uh, Italians at that point. The Germans begin to look at this and they say, hey, they want to play, become a rival to the British world empire. And so they begin to try to block British domination, mostly by going to southern Africa and working both eastward and westward towards the center to try to choke off any of Britain's uh, claims. Again, Britain itself is trying to move, there it goes, uh, north from South Africa and south from Egypt. And so that's what they do. We talked about before that the Dutch East India Company used Cape Town in South Africa as a major part of its trading network. And so Dutch people and Dutch farmers have been living and trading with the Africans in South Africa for several hundred years at this point. When England decides that it needs South Africa in order to help create a stopping point, a halfway point between ships going from London, sailing south around Africa, stopping in South Africa and moving around from there. Well, the British miners who are searching for diamonds and other precious metals begin to run into the Dutch farmers that are there. That leads into conflict. The Dutch there are called the Boers, and this is going to lead to a very cruel war between the English and the Boers. And it's going to lead to the first Boer War and the second Boer War as the British begin to try to push the Boers out of that. And while all this is happening, the English and the Dutch are also having to fight the major native African tribe that's there of the Zulus. The Zulus are one of the great warrior tribes of the great warrior peoples of world history. Uh, they have a long and um, very extended and, and very glorious military record if you're in the military history stuff from there. And so the English are trying to fight from there. It becomes a big, huge, giant mess. But who prevails again is Great Britain. After the two Boer Wars, the British helped the Boers rebuild and were to further push out and then later subjugate the Zulus in South Africa. The best example of somebody trying to show forth their dominance in Africa themselves is the British imperialist Cecil Rhodes. And Cecil Rhodes's big dream as a railway manager and as a telegraph operator is to create the Great North, uh, the Great African Railroad to connect Cairo to Cape Town. It's Cairo to Cape Town. Railroad. And so he's a big proponent for that. You might have heard of some of Cecil Rhodes's other things. If you kind of want to be a, a great scholar, you could be a Rhodes Scholar, which is a scholarship that he set up to try to bring some of the best and brightest students from the United States to study in the United States, right, to kind of share the ideas that way. Cecil Rhodes is also the founder of the De Beers Mining Company, and you probably have seen their advertisements and um, have, have seen uh, – their jewelry that they make because what do they find in South Africa? The British find diamonds. And so there's diamonds all over the place and they begin to pick these up. But because the De Beers company and Cecil Rhodes begins to see that, oh my goodness, there's a whole heck of a lot of diamonds all over the place that if they sell them, the supply is just too much. So the De Beers company pretty much 
in the late 1800s and the early 1900s creates one of the one the great advertising campaigns of modern times and you can make a claim in world history of the idea that a diamond lasts forever right uh the idea that you need to pay three months salary for a diamond engagement ring the idea of a diamond engagement ring is all invented by the de beers mining company uh, again, to try to get people to buy their diamonds, and there's a whole lot of uh, kind of shady stuff that's dealing with there, and still problems with the diamond industry. Thanks to our buddy Cecil Rhodes. If you've seen the movie Ghosts in the Darkness with Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer talking about um, the ghost is being the lions because trying to build this railroad they in the area of Sabo in Africa, they run into the man-eating lions of Sabo. And you can go see both of these lions if you go to the Field Museum and you walk down the stairs. Uh, to, to like where if you're probably another field museum where you eat all your food there, there's the two stuffed lions that the uh, that they had to hire uh, Colonel Patterson to go and go kill them. And again, that's right in the field museum in Chicago, okay, which is go see that. It's pretty cool. This is the Fashoda crisis, and as we said, the British are working north and are working south. The French are working this, and they meet at Fashoda. And again, this becomes a much bigger deal back in Paris and London than the actual fighting. If there is not very much on the ground itself, and as this political cartoon is showing you, who backs down? The big British bulldog is able to go and pull Fashoda for itself and fight off the French poodle in the spot there. You also have the British working through the Sudan, right, as they move towards Khartoum against the Mahdi, uh, a uh, Muslim force, right, led by the Mahdi, who, who's trying to lead an insurrection against the British working through the Sudan, and again at the Battle of Khartoum. Uh, the British suffer uh, one of their big defeats there. In terms of South Africa, again, the British, uh, what builds up to the Boer War, as you can see, the British Empire is shooting out all these different people, and they're landing on the poor Dutch miner there in South Africa. They kind of really start to overwhelm the Boers, and so the Dutch Boers in South Africa fight back. This leads to a pretty brutal war, as the British don't trust any of the villagers uh, who they believe are supporting the Dutch Boer fighters who are running off every time they're trying to fight them. So the British come up with the idea, well, let's burn all the villages and let's go and round up all of the uh, Dutch uh, Boer women and children and, and people who aren't fighting and concentrate them in these camps in one spot and leading to the term concentration camp. And as you can probably imagine, uh, there's lots of stories of pretty horrible and terrible things, including cases of starvation, which becomes a major cause celebre all around the world for the British to start doing this as this poor kid who's starving to death in the care, quote unquote, of the British right, in these concentrations. This is the Zulu king, Quechua, and he leads the Zulu tribe in a war to try to kick not only the Boers, but also the British out of South Africa. And he is able to lead his forces to destroy a column of British soldiers at the Battle of Slandawana in, uh, in the late 1800s. And again, this is one of the great defeats of a colonial nation um, by a... Uh, a, a smaller um, a, a native population from there. There's Island Rwanda. You can think of Sinning Bull's victory at uh, and Crazy Horse at the Battle of Little Bighorn, where there are cases of these native peoples fighting off the um, colonial powers. But again, it, it doesn't work out very well. And again, you get also stories of later on in that campaign after defeating the British. At Lisland, about 200 British soldiers at Rourke's Drift are able to fight off the entire Zulu army thanks to their uh, Lee Enfield rifles and other stuff. And this is all from the movie uh, Zulu, if you want to go and check that out from there. That's, this, that's a shot from the movie right there. It's got Michael Caine, Stanley Baker. Uh, and so again, this is a little, just it's a it's a very interesting story, the Battle of Rourke's Drift. And I, I guess this is just the, this is not the, it's the, it's the regular postcard of the penny I just showed you. Um, but it, the most Victoria Crosses, which is the highest um, Medal of Valor that can be given in the British Army, were given over 26 were given at this one battle alone. Is again, the soldiers were surrounded and had to fight them off from there. So they're going to put their hold on all of Africa. So to finish our scramble of Africa up, what does come out of Africa is the model for imperialism and the model that all European countries are trying to replicate 
is the British control of Egypt. Now, the British domination of Egypt has become, become this model for new imperialism. Egypt has been controlled, as we saw, since the time of being taken over by Alexander the Great, by the Romans, by different groups of um, Arabic tribes in the Muslim conquests, the Ottomans, the Fatimids, the Pelusids, before they finally win their independence in 1849. But as a new nation, they begin to run into severe economic and debt problems. And so they try to uh, work their way out. They try to work their way out by having Britain and France come into Egypt and build the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is going to cut a canal, a waterway, from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. And so from the Red Sea, you then go into India and Asia from there. And this becomes incredibly important for the Europeans because you're pretty much cutting your time and distance in half. Instead of having to sail all the way around south Africa through the Indian Oceans to India to Asia, you can just sail from Western Europe through the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal. And you're cutting that distance in half. As Britain begins to have a stronger stranglehold on India and in China and in the Pacific, the British begin to see that the Suez Canal is extraordinarily important for their foreign policy and for holding their empire together. And so they go in and they make Egypt a protectorate of Great Britain in the year 1882. And it's for a very long time, um, not really until the mid of the 20th century, the mid 1900s, that Egypt finally is able to gain its independence. And we even see other places like during the 1956 Suez Crisis where the British actually parachute soldiers to hold the Suez Canal as uh, problems begin to emerge between the Soviet Union and the NATO powers in that country. So this is the Suez Canal. Again, it goes from Port Said on the Mediterranean side to Port Suez on the Red Sea. And so you then sail your boat from the Mediterranean through the Red Sea. This is important because it's cutting this difference in half. And again, it's not half half. You can see the numbers right there. But instead of saying south, all the way around Africa, all through the Indian Ocean, you can just zip right through the Suez Canal. And you're cutting that distance from London to Mumbai in half. And as London begins to exert more and more control over India, and the other places, it becomes vitally important. And this is the Suez Canal um, in the 1800s there, and it seems pretty easy. It's understandable. It's important to understand that the Suez Canal is pretty easy digging. You're just taking sand and you're moving it all over the place. So the French uh, think that they can replicate what they did here at the Suez Canal by going to Panama. And again, they're going to run into different problems, but that's a story for another day, another class, and another time.